Yes, looks good to me. It should yes. be like a little thing. Let me see if I can just put it into bigger view. Still good? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, hello. So my name's Craig Innes. I'm currently doing a postdoc with the, um, the RAD lab in Edinburgh, which is uh, robust autonomy and decision making. Um, it's basically like a big robotics lab. I don't know if you've ever been to the base center in Edinburgh, but it's just like lots of things in there. Um, and I, I was previously doing kind of the intersection of symbolic logic with probabilistic base nets type stuff in my PhD. And I've sort of tried to transition this over to robotics applications. Um, so you'll probably see a similar theme there. I guess I wanted to start off by saying like I looked on the, the LAIV uh, site and it seems like there's like a lot of shared terminology that seems to mean different things to different people in terms of safety and verification and uh, guarantees and certification and things like for some of you it seems to mean um, smashing SMT solvers and type semantics and finite automata into probabilistic settings. For some people it seems to be about like robustness metrics, for other people it seems to be about like constraint aware loss functions and neural networks and stuff. So I thought what I'd do here is talk about a couple of my recent papers and um, but first step back and sort of give a scenario that I work with to sort of establish what I mean by these things when I'm talking about them. So um, also, here's my email here <laughs> on this one if you want to like shoot me a message afterwards or something like that. So, um, yeah, so this picture that's on screen here is basically a kind of a mock up simulation of um, a setup that we've actually got in our lab right now as part of the, the Safer Surgery platform, uh, which is spelled S A I for surgery. It's, you know, really great pun <laughs> but so the idea is here you've got these two ur10 robot arms and um, that are like mounted on the the ceiling uh, they've got six or seven degrees of freedom you've got um two kind of rolling uh, gray trays that might have like surgical items on them you've got a surgical adjustable table in the middle you've got vision you've got potentially uh four mounted cameras that are connects that have depth and things so you've got perception if you want it there um, and this is just kind of a platform where we can think about doing different robotic tasks on this right so the kind of question I or problem that I want to start off with is say that you have like you're a designer maybe you're doing some ML algorithm maybe you're doing more classical control and you want to go okay um, I've designed this robot controller let's say it's like a pick and place controller right I've got to pick up stuff from like one tray and put it into the other. Um, and what I wanna say is like, okay, what's the specification for that task? Like, what am I trying to accomplish? Uh, and really when I think about it, there's sort of two parts to that. Uh, one is to say there's the like task specification itself. So that's literally saying out loud what the goal is of the task and what are the relevant constraints where, you know, I'll fail if I don't do these kind of things. So on the slide here, I've put, you know, I want to move the knife cube. I've <laughs> made a typo there, but move the knife from the tray on the left tray to the right side such that, so that's the like higher goal. And then you might say like, I don't want to take longer than eight seconds. I don't, if I drop the knife before it reaches destination, that's a failure. And um, I don't want to collide with any of the people or things like that. Uh, and maybe I have a perception uh, constraint as well, right? I, I don't want to move it in a trajectory such that I obscure um, one of the objects from the camera, right? Those things sort of make up um, the task specification and the goal, if you like. Uh, but then there's also this kind of slightly less talked about thing, which it has various different names, but here I'm saying like the environment specification, which is what's the, the description of all the environments and the variations in the ranges in which I can reasonably expect this algorithm to work, right? So you might if you were having some higher level description for this, you might say, well, there's two trays, they're within reach of the arm, right? So I don't have to worry about that. There's one tray to the left of the table and there's one to the right. So I have these kind of geometric relations here. And um, the knife is no heavier than 200 grams. Like, I don't know exactly, it might be somewhere within there, but I know that's the like upper limit on it. Um, the knife always starts within the left tray. So that's again, this kind of like containment relation. 
um, you know, and so on. There's four cameras, they're facing the centre. You can think of various things. So what I want to do is say, given that I've designed some specific controller, right? I've designed some algorithm. Um, how do I get some confidence um, or sense that it will work in the variety of environments that I've laid out? And I'm reasonably confident that it does the task in like a good range of environments. So how, how do I make myself confident of that assertion? Uh, so what I'm going to do is in this talk, I'm going to first talk about the problems inherent when you go into digging into the environment specification and then ones in the task specification. And you'll see in a moment why those are kind of like separated. And then in the end, if there's time, I will um, attempt to see how the two can be integrated into more of a kind of a holistic framework. So let's start with the environment specification first. So one thing I want to first set up is like what we're even talking, the problem we've been talking about here. So in robotics, right, if you've got some RL algorithm, um, typically what you would do is you would run it for 10,000 episodes and react converge. You can't really do that on a real robotic system, right? Because, you know, one run of your robot will take maybe like a minute or so. You have to manually reset it. Those systems don't really work. So typically what we're talking about is designing a, a digital twin in simulation to run those multiple simulations on. Uh, and then like once we've got some certainty that it works in all environments in the simulation, um, we can be reasonably confident about the transfer if the simulation is fairly accurate. Um, and this, this, like, this is just to say with these examples on the left, this is often a problem, right? You will often find that there's a bug that's specific to your initial input configuration. So I've, I've pulled up a screenshot here from data efficient reinforcement learning for dexterous manipulation. Um, so in that paper, they're teaching an RL, RL algorithm to grip a red cube and then stack it on top of a blue cube. Um, it's a very classic sort of problem. Um, the only issue is it works most of the time, but it's an RL problem. So there is a reward function attached to it. And the reward function is not exactly the same as the goal of the task, right? So here in this one, the, they get a reward for the, how did they say it again? The, the height of the bottom of the um, red cube. Works fine most of the time because if you stack it, it's fine. But actually in certain instantiations, if you place the red cube just right, um, there's a, a weird behavior, which is that the um, gripper just learns to flip the red cube upside down because, hey, like it's increased the height of the bottom. There we go, done. So really you have to have some sense of like um, testing to do that. Um, and if we're wanting to do some semi like exhaustive testing with the space, the question is, how do we actually set that up in a way where it's like not a nightmare to do and people will actually do it? At the moment, there's the kind of like dominant forces here are one, you do what um, I've seen most people do, which is you just manually set up your environment in uh, a simulator. So here I've put Compelius in here. Um, you try it out in one configuration, it works. Then you go in and you maybe move the robot arm about, you move the um, the cube to the edge of the table, you see if it works again. Once you've done that five or six times, you go, okay, seems like it works. Um, this is sort of equivalent in regular software testing to like what they call exploratory testing, which is just like you twiddle about with some things and you sort of say like, oh, I think this might be a problem. I, I, I want to explore what happens at the edge cases. Okay, it seems fine. Um, but one, that requires a lot of manual work because you have to physically move the things around. And two, it's not particularly exhaustive. Um, the other thing you might want to try is if you're, the, the variations in your environment are in some sense just completely unconstrained, then it's fairly easy to automate that, right? So this is some 70 real transfer paper, um, put unconstrained mutation here. All they're really doing is um, changing like the positions of objects within a square and varying the, the lighting parameter and the color parameter. So those are just like, you have three floats and you just like put them through a random num number generator. Um, fine, but if your problem area is any more complicated than that, then you're gonna immediately run into problems where you have to actually start that this won't do, right? So often in your environment set up for a robotics problem, you have 
particular geometric constraints which you want to the thing so you will have like objects that are inside other objects this one has to be a certain distance away from that to the left this object has to be facing this one so there's variation within there but i have to satisfy these geometric constraints and um, and often the time if you do have those higher demand things you end up doing the third thing which is you just literally custom program the randomization you want for your thing right so you go in and this thing can get quite complicated fast this code here is basically just saying i want this particular set of objects um to be within the boundaries of my table surface and not fall off the edge and also for one of them to be on top of the other but suddenly i'm having to do a lot of like maths i'm having to like code in the like the bounding boxes of the objects it's all very like i might just not bother if i'm feeling lazy so the problem we want to solve is how do we have a system where someone can specify their environment, sort of like we had on this previous slide, kind of declaratively, and then have a system that automatically figures out the relations and the geometry to uh, automatically come up with samples to cover the space and to test it in an interesting way. Um, and the answer that we've essentially come up to with that is this, uh, this programming domain specific language called probrobscene. Um, so what this essentially is, is a probabilistic programming language that has in it these inherent um, relational predicates that are most attuned to the kind of geometry of setting up physical spaces. So you, I don't know if you can particularly read this table on the right, this table one, but you don't have to like fully imbibe it. It's essentially just saying like, here's the kind of variation of things we can talk about. So we can say that an object is at a particular vector. We can say it's beyond another thing by a certain amount. We can say it's arbitrarily in a region. We can say, well, it's somewhere to the left ahead, above, behind this thing. We can say it's completely contained within another region. And we can say that multiple objects are aligned along a particular axis. And we can talk about the orientation and say that one thing's facing another. Just a kind of nice suite of things that you might want to specify declaratively. And then over on the left here, I've essentially given one of the specifications I had in that previous slide, right? Which is there's two trays between 30 and 40 centimeters in width that's on the table. And then that comes out to something in the language that sort of looks like that statement, right? Table on in the center, tray completely on the table with the width is, and those brackets mean like, a uniform range um, and then another tray that's completely on the table with the width in this range um, so the magic of what's happening here is that once you've declared this um, specification the system will then convert that into convex regions that can then be sampled from and then it's just a matter of hooking this up to the particular simulator um, so i've got a few more things i want to talk about with this but before i move on i'll give kind of one slide that sort of hints at the well, two slides, <laughs> the hint at the kind of technical meat of what's going on here. Um, but if you want more details about like how all these things are happening, this is actually in the proper obscene paper and you can like go look at it. So this is just like a fuller example. Um, and this is just to sort of demonstrate from this thing on the left, you can see things like we have multiple relations that are kind of being intersected, right? So for here, I've put that the tray is completely on the table. Um, it's ahead of the robot and it's to the left of um, the like center of the table. So you have to, in some sense, um, if you're doing it yourself, figure out what the intersection of those three um, geometric specifiers is. Um, you've also got, for the camera, I've got these bracketed ranges, which is doing like a kind of uniform thing. Um, and then just on the right, this is just showing a kind of visualization if you can think of the, the little gray, <laughs> it's not great, but like the little grey cubes are like the robots, the red thing is the table, then there's the trees in it. This is just showing, showing that the system is automatically generating instantiations of the specification. So they're all different, they all vary, but they all follow this specification that I've got on the left. And so how does that work? Well, to kind of give an overview, what happens is, first we have this specification at the top. You can see at the kind of top left, I've got tray completely on T. Um, then we go through a process of converting each of those relations into their convex regions that they apply to, right? So this is just like kind of set notation for like the convex region of that's like completely in the table. Um, I should say as well, one thing I missed is like, it will also resolve any dependencies between your relations. So you might say um, the tray is completely on the table and then there's a cube in the tray. 
So if you think about what that means, you first have to figure out where the tray is going to be before you can define what the region of the cube is going to be. So this de dependency man management of these specifiers is done in the background as well. But so first you convert it into this convex region notation. And now that we've got these as these kind of mathematical convex objects, we're basically about done, right? Because we can apply um, a sampling algorithm like hit and run, which is essentially like a, a way to nicely sample from convex regions where you can think of like a pinball bouncing around. And if you bounce the pinball around enough, eventually that point that you sample will be uniform in the space. Then once you've got those, yeah, Matthew? Can I just ask, so these convex regions, they're, they're still, presumably when you resolve them to convex regions, they're not actual fully instantiated convex regions. They're convex regions with variables that depend on other convex regions. In yeah, the, so this is this is what I was alluding to at the um, dependencies. When I was saying like there's a kind of dependencies, which is there's a sort of like laziness going on, which is that you say this is a convex region, but the the x dimension of this particular part of the constraint, and um, before I can say what that I is, I first have to sample the position of the tree. Okay, so, so something essentially is, in the yeah. yeah exactly essentially first is defines a dependency graph of like the way in which you need to sample. And then like it says, okay, like once I've sampled that, I'll have the full um, definition of this convex region. And then once I've got a sample for that, I can stick that in here because this requires the width of this object and so on. That answers it, yeah? Cool. Um, yeah, and then so once we've got this like concrete instantiation of all the properties that we're varying, then it's just a case of, then you've basically got yourself a JSON file that you can then hook up to a simulator and do this. Um, so that's kind of like a, a bird's eye view of the technicalities there. Um, I've just put as well, <clears throat> just as a sort of exercise, I took this example specification that I've been talking with, um, and I literally just coded up a basic pick in place between two robots. You know, first it picks from the left train, and the other one picks up and puts another one. Um, it's a pretty simple setup, really. There's not even any particular perception or machine learning confusion going on here. It's basically just like basic blob detection, trajectory following. But even here, I was kind of surprised that there's like a lot of um, bugs that I found just from running it through this automated um, environment, right? So on the right here, you have the task result, right? And I've 74 of the 100 were successes, but I also had what I've called perception faults in the sense that like I found a misspecification in what my environment can do. Uh, and that, and you can sort of see it in this perception fault image. Um, the range of the camera is actually less than the um, the range of like what the table can deal with. So sometimes it will only see a fraction of the cube, and then the blob detection fails. Then it fails to pick it up correctly, so you get a failure there. And um, there's also reachability constraints, right? So like usually it's within reach of the robot arm, but actually if you put it very close. To the robot arm, there's not a combination of joints that can actually reach it. So, you know, that came out of this, these random ones. And then there's also poor grip, which is um, sometimes there's a rim to this tray. So, even though I put the dimensions of just like the full tray, if it gets partly put on the side of it, um, the grip's so basic that it just like does a standard grip and it drops it halfway through. And um, so, all these came out of this just, you know, I wouldn't have checked for this otherwise. Um, and this is a fairly simple controller, but it's just to say, like, if we can give people these tools, um, then we can actually get at sort of better confidence in what these algorithms are actually doing. Um, and I, I guess I maybe wanted to petition you to think about um, other ways in which this could be used as well, right? So the immediate thing that is striking me at the moment is um, there's a chance for an active learning loop here, right? So if you have some limited amount of samples, you can say, okay, like, let me run 100, see which ones are successful and failures find the failure spots and then run it again with like particular focus on those spots. Um, so that's, let me see what my time is. That's potentially all I want to say about um, the environment side of it at the moment. Um, I might now switch to the task side, uh, unless there's any kind of questions about understanding that bit so far. Cool. Okay, so now we move to the task side. If you remember, that's more kind of the standard way of thinking about these formal specifications, right? You have like a goal and you have like constraints on your system. Um, 
Yeah, and it, so immediately we run into like a problem when we're talking about robotics here, which is that we have this weird kind of hybrid problem of what our specification is, which is, okay, we have things that are very easy to verbalize uh, and actually would be quite difficult to show through examples. So um, things like, you know, don't tip the cup until you're very close to the bowl, right? That's kind of like a specification where I can just say it out and I can probably write out that constraint. Um, doing it with lots of examples is probably a waste of time or very difficult because there's like positive and negative. But there's also parts would be the opposite, right? It's very difficult to verbalize what's going on, um, but actually probably with a data-driven approach, we can get at it, right? So like the way in which you precisely slice um, this grapefruit with the pressure or the way in which you do a handover to like another person, right? Like actually there's a lot of techniques for doing that in a data-driven way. So the question is, we have these formal constraints. We have this data stuff. How do we actually apply it so that we can get both and certify our data things so that we're with respect to the symbolic constraints? Um, yeah, OK, so what I'm going to do is like give a, a minute on like <laughs> maybe what learning from demonstration looks like, just so we're all on the same page. Then I'll sort of like say what the kind of formal specifications look like for robotics. And then I'll kind of like do the bit of smashing them together. So um, this is a setup in our lab uh, that we use for a lot of things. We've got a PR2 robot that has actually since died since making this slide. So it's kind of, we've moved on. It like no longer functions correctly. It's getting retired. But basically the setup is, this is, um, I don't know if you've seen this before, this is like the HTC Vive uh, for virtual reality. You can essentially use this as a teleoperation system. So um, this is my colleague, Jordan, there that's had his face blurred for a paper submission. Uh, but what happens is like, if he moves the, the vibe like this and then tips over, the PR2 mimics his behavior exactly. And not only does it mimic it exactly, but it's also recording lots of information as it goes. So it's got a head mounted camera so it can see the initial scene and records that to a file. For all the movements, it records the exact trajectory of the arm and all the joint movements. So you have all this data of the entire trajectory and the starting scene. And you have multiple demonstrations by Jordan in different situations. So now basically one way you can run with that is we've got a supervised learning problem, right? Given a starting configuration of the table, uh, what's the trajectory I need to do to accomplish the task? Um, and that's essentially like a very simple method for doing learning from demonstration. Uh, this behavior cloning, which is a supervised way of doing it. So you've got this training data. It's basically just what I said. You have the input images, you have trajectory labels. Don't worry about all this uh, DMP symbols and things. This is just a formula from the paper. But the important thing to take away from this is this is basically just a mean squared error, right? You've got what's my learn trajectory? What's the actual label trajectory? I want to minimize that distance. This is the simplest thing you could think of for like cloning behavior. Um, does that make sense though, actually? I know I've said it's simple, like that's kind of clear, yeah? Got some nods, yeah. Um, Craig, can I just ask what, what stops it just replicating the demonstration? What's it doing to kind of mutate or change it so it's learning rather than just replicating something it's seen exactly? Yeah, so um, there's like multiple things you can do, right? So um, this is maybe more into the nitty gritty details of, um, basic learning from demonstration rather than the like symbolic integration but um so one of the things you can do is well you can do your classic neural network tricks right which is that you're you're doing dropout between the things you might have like a variational part in the middle you can cross validate these sort of things but also um, what's happening particularly in the robotics case is we're putting some inductive structure in here so this dmp stands for a dynamic movement primitive um which is essentially incorporating some structure that we've got a movement that has a start and end goal that is like moving along a smooth trajectory. So if you can think about what that's doing, it's imposing some structure and it's like limiting the number of parameters you have to play with. So in a sense, if you want to generalize to the test set, you have to find a general formula for this DMP that's going to fit all the different variations and demonstrations. Does that kind of get at what you were asking or? I've realized I'm not sure you can actually see me. Uh, yes, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I can only see like a like a little highlight reel of people. Let me see if I, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. 
I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm just playing with Zoom now. I'll move on. Uh, okay, so we've got this sort of basic behavior cloning. We've also got these kind of formal specifications or like th things we want to verbalize, like don't tip the cup until you're close to the bowl. So what we need now is essentially a formal way of talking about these robotic specifications that deals with constraints through time, right? Don't do this until this, always do this, eventually do this. Um, unfortunately, this just like exists, right? What we're talking about here is linear temporal logic, um, which is a kind of modal logic which deals with constraints through time. Um, so just for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm just checking my time as I go. Uh, this is, these are like a couple of examples here. So on, maybe a best way to start is with this right-hand side, which is just basically the full grammar of LTL. So you've got your regular stuff like negation, conjunction, things like that. But you've also got these temporal constraints along the side. So this square means that this formula will always be true throughout time. Uh, the diamond means uh, eventually this thing will be true. So you have to make this true at least once in the system. And then you have this like um, phi one until phi two, which is saying you must have this constraint hold at least until the second constraint fires at some point, at which point you don't have to worry about the first one anymore. Um, you can also get variations of this where you have specific intervals on the thing. So you can say, and um, this will always be true from time zero to time eight. And that gets into more signal temporal logic. It's just to say, if you want more specificity, you don't have to think in this discrete world of time. And then over here, I've just sort of given a few translations of these environment specifications that you saw before into the formal logic, just to show you know, it's kind of possible, right? So you can say grabbed objects shouldn't slap one in the gripper. Um, you can say, you know, move to the target. So we're saying like, eventually um, it will always be the case that the target object is within some epsilon of our like target region. You can, you can think about it, constructing these in like a fairly intuitive way. Um, so before I move on, I, what I should say now is like, so we're getting into these data-driven approaches we have this constraint language, but we have a big kind of problem, which is that these are symbolic constraints that don't, like, it's not clear how we would fit these into a cost function, for example, because, you know, they're just like true or not. So um, what does that mean for like a continuous thing where you usually want to extract gradients and learn things and do that whole system? Well, it turns out, you know, with these temporal logics, there's lots of ways to think of it less as success or failure and more as a robustness metric. So there's a lot going on in this slide. I've put like the entire conversion of this robust metric up the side. You don't have to worry about that. What this is basically saying is if I've got a trajectory and I've got some LTL constraint, what I can do is I can put a number on it on how well it conforms to that constraint in terms of, um, you know, if it's successful, it's going to be positive. If it fails, it's going to be negative. But you're saying like, okay, well, how much was it successful, right? So if I've got to put something in a target location and I get it one millimeter from the boundary of that target location, it's not actually great because if I moved it a little bit, it would fall outside. But really, if it's right in the center of the bullseye, that's like very robust because even if I perturb the object a little bit, it's going to be fine. So it's so this uh, Hagigi uh, metric is encoding that sense of spatial robustness. But we also have another type of robustness we think about with these things through time, which is temporal robustness, right? So if I say to you, move the cube to the end of the table within eight seconds, and you do it within 7.95 seconds, it's not great um, because you've sort of just made it in time. I would prefer you do it quicker if you can. So you get more points for those things. Um, but now we're almost sorted, right? Because um, we've got like a numerical metric for like how well we do. And then the only bits that are really non-continuous are these things when we talk about maximums and minimums. So if you think about for um, eventually, what you're saying is like, well, I just need this to be correct at one point. So um, I'll just take the maximum of this metric at any point in time. And that's basically the same as saying, like, I'll eventually do it. If no, if no point is like positive, then I've failed. Um, so maximum is not continuous, but then you can just use a soft maximum, right? You can sort of smooth out. And then there you go. You've got this continuous metric. You can extract gradients from it. 
maybe you see where I'm going with this. Now you just have a combined cost metric. Right. So again, I've put all the formula in here, but like the important thing is just the colors that you're saying. We've now got this mixture constraint that's mixing our behavior cloning loss with this bit in green, which is the constraint loss. Um, and you can do even better than that if you want. And I, I'm happy to explain this in more detail at the end. You can do this in an adversarial way, which is you can say, OK, well, I want you to satisfy this constraint, but I want to make sure it's satisfied for some epsilon ball around the training thing that I've shown you, right? So don't just pick the example I showed you and generate a sample within the epsilon ball around that training example that you think is likely to fail. Just like follow the gradient through it. Um, yeah, but so mostly it's the combination of these two things. If you want me to explain more of the kind of like adversarial part of it, I can kind of talk about that at the end. Um, but yeah, so basically you can kind of see where this is going. Again, I've just put like a little um, case study here to show you this in action. So this is, I, we trained this cut pour using Jordan's demonstrations. Um, you can see this one on the left, uh, the DMP one. This is just with the examples. And when it tries to generalize to a slightly different position, it ends up actually tapping the cut prematurely because it doesn't actually have a sense of like what it's trying to do with the pouring. Um, although the tapping motion is kind of complicated itself, the constraint that we want it to conform to, which is like, don't actually tip the cup until you're above the constrainer. We can just write that down. So this DMP plus LTL actually gets it right. And you can see from the graphs here, this is just to kind of prove what's happening. The kind of, um, the blue one is with the LTL and the orange one is without. And you can see, you know, for example, if you look at the role of the rest, um, it slightly delays it for a second compared to the original. Um, it also brings forward uh, some of the X and Y coordinates. So it's within there earlier. And, you know, it does the obvious thing where it's basically like enforcing a delay by the combination of those two things. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> I forgot where I was going. But, so that's kind of all I want to say about that one as well. This is also um, in a paper called Elaborating on Learned Demonstrations via Temporal Logic, um, which I'll give a link to at the end. Um, and now if I've got a second of time, basically what I want to say is what I'm currently working on, which is we have these two parts of the puzzle now, right? We have a way for systematically going through all the variations and environments. And we also have this task specification that we can actually look at with a metric and see how well have we done, and do we want to enforce it? So now the obvious thing to do is say, can we like combine these into some sort of integrated testing framework? Um, and I want to sort of just give two ideas to sort of spark some thoughts in it. And then maybe we can talk about, you know, if there's any sort of relation to what you guys are doing. Um, so direction one is um, we have this um, task specification that we can extract gradients from. Why don't we use that as an optimization to drive falsification rather than sampling, right? So I've drawn the diagram here. So we have our original environment specification we put it through prob, prob scene, we get out these geometric input, input constraints, we come up with some sample, we run it through the simulator, and then we get out a robustness metric at the end. And that metric gives us a derivative that we can then push back into the sample and say, okay, I want you to drive the samples towards where you think this is going to do the worst. Um, so you can do that with a standard gradient descent. You can also at this point start talking about Bayesian optimization, right? And say, okay, well, I've got a loss function I want to optimize. I've got like my input constrained regions. Let's just like use the best tools out there to push this towards the region that I think it's going to fail in. So that's one option. I'll just say that idea of like, I've tried this out there. I can talk about the various reasons you would want to do this and the reasons that it might fail for the particular continuous tasks that you're doing. But I also just want to briefly get in a second idea which is um, you might not just care about finding a particular bug, right? Like falsification is essentially like an optimization that's driving you towards one spot where you fail. Um, you might be interested in, okay, well, what's the performance across the whole coverage of the space? And how do I predict that it's gonna do? And maybe not only do I want to know where it'll fail, but where, it, for example, it's on the precipice of failing, those parts where, you know, the robustness is very small. So a sim to real transfer might cause it to fail. So what we're talking about here is 
we can't exhaustively check everywhere because for one, it's like an a continuous space. So in what way can we, instead of sampling, um, choose the situation so it provides the best coverage over the space? And essentially now what we're talking about is building a surrogate model for predicting our task specification um, using the best amount of data. And this is essentially what uniform design is about. So I've put up a few pictures here just to say, you know, if you look at this n equals 25 and n equals 101, if you just randomly sample, samples actually tend for a fixed amount of samples to not give good coverage of the space, even for a uniform distribution. They tend to clump and you get these like places where there's lots of them and then space is totally not covered. A better thing to do is this kind of quasi random distribution where you actually get low discrepancy coverage of the whole space. Now, most of the work here is to do with how do I cover a hypercube well? That's like always the classic problem. But here we've got like a slightly different problem, which is, well, we have these arbitrary convex regions. Can we still do a uniform design over them? And the answer is you can act like there are techniques that you can do this. And we're working on integrating this into Rob Robson as well, so that you can give a declarative specification and without having to know the intricacies of inverse cumulative distribution function transformations and things like that, you can just say, give me a uniform design for the specification for 25 samples and it will do it. And so this is just showing some transformations into 2D and 3D convex spaces. And you should be able to see that the points are much better distributed around the entire space than if I was just to run as many samples as I can afford. So hopefully you would get a better sense of how it's doing over the whole space. And if you want to build a surrogate model, you have a better quality data set to assess how it's going to do. And that's kind of all I want to say about the other directions there. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to like stop at this point and just, I guess, kind of chat with you about, you know, what your thoughts are on this and how it might relate to the kind of stuff you're doing in your lab. So cheers. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. That was a, uh, yeah, awesome talk. Uh, super clear. It is scarily similar to what we are doing in many respects. Uh, I guess the key difference, we're trying to do this for neural networks. So again, like reinforcement learning systems, neural networks are full of bugs that are very difficult to find until you put them into production and it all goes wrong. Uh, the key difference is, I think, is that your statement that uh, you mentioned that you can't exhaustively verify all the points in your state space, right, in your sample space, where it could go wrong, you have to resort to sampling. In the case of neural networks, people have developed algorithms, even though it's a continuous state space, they've developed algorithms that do formally verify that there is no counterexample, no example where it, the specification is going to be violated. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, other people have asked, yeah, I, to ask I, questions. Well, I can respond to that one, which is, um, I think that's a good point. I think there is a lot of value in these very formal certification parts. I guess that was what I was talking about when I was looking at your site and I was seeing a lot of it's to do with integrating, for example, SMT solvers or type semantics into the, the sort of structure of the neural network itself and into the certification process. The problem here is what I'm saying is when you move this to an actual application domain and you're running these things through, suddenly your error function is going through a lot more steps than just like input neural network output, right? If you think about what's happening here, there's input, there's a neural network perhaps that's doing control or perception, and then there's an entire physics simulation that's going through. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, and like the, the physics of that may be unclear. It's definitely unclear for the real world, um, but even for like doing a simulation, like unless your knowledge of how physics simulators work is very good, it's as good as like a black box as well. So the question is like, either you have to say like, so you, you, sort of formal verification is kind of out of the way unless you're doing physics papers. Um, so how do we actually either run that gradient all the way back through the loop or take good ways to cover this space when we can't just like have complete control of, over every single step of the process? I think is the difference between this like formal certification and like applying to like a robotics situation. Yep, no, it makes sense. Uh, Luca, you had your hand up. Yeah, hey, I wanted to ask a question about the last bit about the LTL formula 